Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to wherever you are in the world. My name is Andrew, and today I would like to teach you how to graph the following polynomial function of negative 2x multiplied by x minus 1 multiplied by x plus 3. So it turns out to kind of sketch this graph, all right, that's kind of the approach, that's the thing we're going to do here. Okay, we're going to sketch it. We're not going to necessarily plot all the local mins and local maxes. Uh, we're just going to get an idea of what the heck this thing is going to look like. So the first thing is we want to determine what the end behavior of the function is going to look like, okay, behavior. End behavior. So the end behavior of the function, it depends on what form you have it in, by the way, you know, it might uh, change the way I would tell you how to look at it. Here we have this in fully factored form, okay, we have basically, you know, three factors more or less. Now they didn't put this in parentheses, but in order to kind of view this, I think it would be best if I do add the parentheses there. All right, we have basically three factors here, and each of those factors is raised to the first power. So to find the end behavior of the function, the first thing we want to do is add up, add up. We want to add up all of those powers. Remember, this is only if you have it in fully factored form, okay? When you add up all of those powers, it's going to be a value of three. Now, what that indicates to me is I'm really concerned about whether this value is odd or even. Now, this is an odd number, okay? And that's going to tell me something about the end behavior, which I'm going to get to in a second. The next thing I need to do is not only determine the, the oh, I gave it away, not only whether it's odd or even, but what the sign of the, what they call leading coefficient is. So basically, when you have this in fully factored form, if you have a negative sign outside of all the factors, right, more or less, then the, uh, overall degree of your uh, polynomial will be negative, okay? So that's another thing I need to know, all right, whether it's going to be positive or negative, and in this particular case, it will be negative. So I have something that's odd and something that's negative. If you had a different function, it wasn't in fully factored form, let's pretend you had something like negative x cubed, you know, minus 2x squared, you know, bop, 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 whatever it is. I, I do not what I'm, whatever I'm writing here has no relationship whatsoever uh, to what is stated there. All I'm saying is that you might see it in this particular form, and then all you're going to do is you're going to look to the coefficient of the highest power. Okay, You're going to realize that the highest power there is going to be odd, so that's basically what we did. And then the leading coefficient there of the highest powered variable is going to be negative. Okay, So both of them would be basically the same. Now, what we do is we have to now understand what is having an odd um, highest power and uh, you know being a negative leading coefficient mean in terms of the end behavior? Well, here's a nice little chart. And what we have now is we have an odd degree and we have a negative leading coefficient. So this is going to be the picture that's going to detail the end behavior. All right. Why do these end behaviors come about from even and odd degrees and positive leading coefficients? I actually have a video out there that explains that, okay? But that's not necessarily the point of this video. Um, I definitely want you to understand why. I'll try to leave a link in the description below, but don't, don't, I, I can't make a promise on that because I, quite honestly, sometimes I can't remember what the heck I'm saying. Um, and uh, uh, the other thing is though, if you do search the channel, I think in this particular um, playlist, you'll be able to find it. I don't want you to just memorize things. I want you to understand it. Okay, but it com there comes a point in time where sometimes memorizing certain things can help us, especially in terms of the speed on your tests, right? If you have to think about this every time, okay, odd degree, all right, let me reason this out. It takes time. I definitely want you to though understand it because in case the problem really gets tough and you have no clue how to solve it, that's where the understanding really makes a big difference. But in some of the easier, similar cases here, you can just memorize some of the stuff. All right, it'll make it faster on the test because quite honestly, right, you're, you're timed. So you have to figure out how to solve these things efficiently. All right, so we have this kind of end behavior. Then number two is to identify the x-intercepts. Okay, x-intercepts. In this particular video, I'm just going to go through, you know, how we do it, why we do it. I have tons of videos out there. Check out this playlist again. Look for the videos where I'm specifically solving for the x-intercepts. I go through in very much detail how to think through it. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take each one of these three factors. So I take my 2x, I set it equal to 0. I'm going to take my x minus 1, set it equal to 0. And then I'm going to take my x plus 3 and set it equal to 0. 
So I solve this, right? The x has to be 0 in order for that 2 times what is going to equal 0. Well, obviously, if x is 0, right? Um, then for the next one, obviously, you're just going to add 1 onto both sides, okay? And that's just going to tell you that x is going to be equal to positive 1. And then similarly, how did that turn into a circle or an oval? I'm not really sure. And you sub would subtract 3 here from both sides, so that's just going to be x is equal to negative 3. All right, and now these represent the x values of the x-intercepts. So if you were to go to your you know, graph here, put a point at 0, put a point at 1, which I'll say over here, and then put a point at like negative 3, okay, roughly about there. So now I'm just going to move these over a little bit and you know, we'll figure that out or fiddle with it a little bit later. So we found our x-intercepts, that's great. Now the next thing we got to do is just kind of determine the local behavior of the function around these x-intercepts, okay? And the local behavior is determined by what they call the multiplicity of each of those factors that gave rise to each of these x-intercepts. So when I use this factor, right, I found out the x-intercept uh, was equal to zero. And the multiplicity, which is just saying what the heck is the number for the power, is an odd multiplicity there, okay? So I have an odd multiplicity. Now what odd multiplicities mean for factors not for the overall uh, function, okay, but for each factor, is the uh, whether the multiplicity is odd or even will tell you whether the function crosses the x-axis or whether it's going to bump, okay? Whether it's going to cross that axis there or whether it's going to bump, all right? It turns out that odds cross, evens bump. So if you notice, all of these are going to be odd, multiplicities. So they all should, we sh should all expect them to then cross, okay? So let's just paste it here and let's paste it here. So now what has to happen is you, you have a couple of conditions, right? Where the function now has to pass through, it has to cross these points. So it's going to cross those points somehow. But yet you have to connect all the points together and you have to make it smooth, right? So obviously this is not going to cross this way. Because how in the world would this kind of turn like this? I mean, that just wouldn't make any sense, right? I mean, it basically wouldn't be a function because then it wouldn't pass the vertical line test. The only way to have, you know, the end behavior up here and for it to cross this is to come down like that now, right? It has to come down, okay? And then it has to cross this point. Now, does it cross it like this or does it cross it like that? Well, it has to cross it like this. Reason being is because if it were to cross it like that, that means you got to turn this thing around and somehow get it back up. But wait a minute, you cross the x-axis again, and that's not one of the x-intercepts, right? So there's only one way to do that. So you kind of come up here, and then I think you get the picture. You're going to come down, right, and then continue on over. Now, how far this thing goes down this way, how far up this thing goes that way, is totally now, it's totally going to be uh, beyond this particular uh, pr most likely where you are in pre-calculus is beyond where we are at the moment, all right? You would you would kind of use calculus to figure out the local mins and the local maxes. Not that you really need to, but um, that would be the most efficient way, and that's usually done in calculus. But anyway, um, so that's the basic shape of the function. The last thing you want to do, and we actually already know what it is, but the last thing you want to do is want to find the y-intercept, okay? That would kind of be the last piece of information uh, that you can use to help you get a good sketch. So what I would do is rewrite the function. This is going to be 2, 2 times x, right? And then in parentheses, this was x minus 1. This is going to be x plus 3. And to find the y-intercept, this is now where the x values in the function are going to be 0. Now, you don't even need to plug this in so much, right? If 0 is out here, this whole term goes to 0. 0 times whatever the heck this would be, even it would be negative 1, though, right? And then whatever the heck this would be, this would also be 3. It doesn't matter. It's all going to 0. Right, so y is going to be equal to 0, and we kind of already knew that because that was also one of the x-intercepts, right? So if x were to be 0, not necessarily does y need to also be 0, but there's a good chance that it's probably going to be, and it will work out to be that way. And it also would make sense here given how I had to draw the graph, right? I had to cross uh, that point of x equals 0, so y should have also been 0, just given the way this graph is kind of working. Okay, so now this was the y-intercept, so we have that already, and this is the basic gist of the graph. Now what you can do is you can go back into your calculator and double-check it. So plug in negative 2x, open the parentheses, do x minus 1. All right, close the parentheses, open them again, and then do x plus 3. 
close them up, make sure you're good, go to window, all right, all right I mean zoom, sorry, go to zoom six for standard, and there you kind of have it, okay? Notice how the graph comes down a lot more than I have it in my picture, but that's okay, right? Uh, notice how the graph only comes up a little bit, and I have that kind of in the picture, but that's not the point, all right? The idea is just to get it that it's coming down here, going to come up, and then come back down, and we know the points at which is going to cross that x-axis. You can see beautifully there that it's negative 3, 0, and 1, and then it's also going to cross the uh, y value equal to 0, right, the y-intercept 0. So that's the idea, all right? But that's all. Thank you guys for tuning in. I really do appreciate it. If you can help us out, that'd be awesome. Like and subscribe. All right, takes two seconds. Just push those buttons. And uh, I look forward to helping you with more problems. Check out our channel because we've got thousands of videos, not only math, but physics and uh, chemistry as well. We've got a whole lot of stuff coming. So stay tuned.